Hi, it's Rob West. And before we get to the podcast, I wanted to tell you about a special group of people. MoneyWise patrons are supporters for this nonprofit ministry that choose to send monthly gifts to support two critical areas. First, helping to extend the reach of our national radio programs, money management app, website, and other resources. And second, providing free MoneyWise app pro scholarships for students or people in financial hardship. Would you consider becoming a MoneyWise patron by making a monthly financial gift to MoneyWise? Just visit moneywise.org and click donate. And thanks in advance for your generous partnership. We're seeing high inflation, rising interest rates, and slow economic growth, but also a strong labor market. Hi, I'm Rob West. Employment doesn't seem to be paying attention to the rest of the economy as job numbers remain strong. I'll talk about that with Jerry Boyer today, as well as some long-term trends. Then it's on to your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is MoneyWise, biblical wisdom for your financial decisions. Well, economist Jerry Boyer joins us again today. He's president of Boyer Research and a MoneyWise contributor. You can read his columns at the Christian Post. Jerry, welcome back. Always a pleasure to be with you. All right, Jerry, what do you make of this labor market? The economy is still adding jobs and employers are still looking for workers. So what's going on, especially amidst the signs of slowdown in every other corner of the economy? Yeah, it's a it's a pretty weird labor market, um, especially if you sort of look at just mechanically the way things correlate in the past, uh, almost like you do with an almanac, right? When the economy slows down, then unemployment spikes, um, and then you're then it seems like the economy is slowing down, but unemployment isn't spiking. In fact, unemployment uh, has been going down lately, uh, and that can get pretty confusing. And then you have to sort of step back and think about what's really going on here. Well, what's really going on is that when they talk about unemployment, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics says the unemployment rate went up or down in a recent report, um, what does that mean? It means that people who are looking for work couldn't find work. That's what an unemployed person means. Hmm. It doesn't refer to someone who has stopped looking for work. So in fact, the unemployment rate went down Um, because not because a bunch of people got jobs, but because a bunch of people stopped looking for work. So it's really odd that way because falling unemployment could be a really great thing or could be really a terrible thing. It'd be a great thing if a bunch of people who wanted jobs got jobs. It could be a terrible thing if a bunch of people said, no, I don't want to work anymore. I, I, I have no hope. Or it's just not worth it anymore to work when I can get so much in the social safety net and I can just play video games or stream Netflix. Or, mm-hmm. you know, I'll just take, you know, I, who needs it? It's a pain in the neck working out there with all these supply chain disruptions, uh, and I'm going to take an early retirement. That's not such a great thing because we're made by God to work. Now, what's been happening in the past few years is our good labor market is largely a matter of people getting out during covid for mm-hmm. obvious reasons, the shutdowns, et cetera, and only a fraction of them coming back in. And part of that is, I think, a shift in work ethic, and part of that is just a shift in demographics. We didn't replace, boomers didn't replace themselves in the labor force. Uh, and so as they age out, there aren't as many people to come in and replace them. Wow, Jerry, there's a lot there that we want to unpack. Uh, Let's begin with this idea that people are just exiting the labor market altogether. You mentioned the extensive social safety net. Obviously, that was enhanced during COVID with additional assistance. A good bit of that has gone away, and yet we just are seeing there's not a huge uh, rush back in. Uh, Why do you think that is, and what are folks doing to cover their expenses? Yeah, well, uh, they could be living off savings. Uh, they could be living off parents in many cases. That's happening. Um, a lot of it went away, but it didn't all get uh, go away. So we still have a pretty lavish social safety net. Uh, yeah. Jack Kemp used to say, what we want is a safety net, but not a hammock. Um, yeah, and the right. American economic establishment and politicians especially, you have to make it so that nobody falls and gets hurt. We're a compassionate yes. society, but you also have to make it so that it's uncomfortable enough 
that you do want to get back up and work again. Uh, and I'm not sure we have that balance quite right. And the other thing is, one of the main reasons people go to work isn't just incentives. One of the main reasons people go to work is they're ashamed not to. Yeah. Um, and that shame, that stigma of being of working age, able to work, and not working, that seems to have disappeared, um, or at least is a lot smaller. So you've got um, young men, for example, who have historically been ashamed to not be working. You have a significant number of young men who are essentially simply living off their parents. On the other hand, a lot of people want to shame them. There are a whole lot of parents who retired early and didn't go back in after COVID. So I don't want to throw this more in one generation than another. Mm, interesting and disturbing at a number of levels. Well, we'll continue to unpack this just around the corner. What about the rebound in the labor participation rate post-COVID? Male versus female, uh, generational, and what are the other kind of big trends affecting the labor market? We're talking with Jerry Boyer here today. More to come just around the corner. Stick around. Do you ever feel stressed or anxious about money? If so, that's normal, but you don't have to accept that. You can find peace of mind and financial security. Learn how with the 31-day devotional, Money Seeking God's Wisdom. You'll find daily questions to reflect on and practical exercises paired with scripture for spiritual and financial growth. Right now, you can request your copy of the Money Seeking God's Wisdom 31-day devotional with a gift of any amount at moneywise.org. Do you feel like your hands are tied with debt, preventing you from serving God? If you have credit card debt, Christian Credit Counselors can help. Through our debt management program, we can get you out of credit card debt about 80% faster while honoring your debt in full. For more information on how Christian Credit Counselors can help, visit ChristianCreditCounselors.org. That's ChristianCreditCounselors.org. Or call 800-557-1985. 800-557-1985. Delighted to have you with us today on MoneyWise. Our guest today is economist Jerry Boyer, president of Boyer Research, a MoneyWise contributor and a columnist at the Christian Post. We're talking today about the labor market and specifically the labor participation rate. Uh, Jerry, we know COVID, of course, reduced the labor participation rate. It didn't rebound in part due to, uh, I think, perhaps the largest factor would be early retirees, that is folks 55 plus taking early retirement. Would you say that's the largest driver? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, on COVID Eve, uh, before we knew it was going to hit us, the labor participation rate was a little over 63%. And in the depths of of um, that uh, shutdown, the labor participation rate was 60%. Well, it's only 3%. Well, Three percent when you've got a country of 300 million. That's a lot of yes. people not working. Right. Um, and what happened is it came back um, you know, for the most part. It came back pretty much entirely for women. It came back about halfway for men of all ages. Interesting. Uh, but the group that never came back was 55 and older. Uh, that's essentially at the same rate as it was kind of at the worst of COVID, maybe up a little bit. So a lot of people took early retirement. You know, that's an option because you're doing financial planning that, you know, th things start to kick in around age 59, et cetera, yeah. where you can take early distributions. So there are all kinds of early retirement. And it looks like a lot of people took that. Yes. And they may be regretting it in light of what the market's done since then. But nevertheless, that's a reality. Uh, Jerry, there's also another huge factor here with regard to the long term trends beyond uh, beyond the aging of the workforce, which I know you told me in our last conversation, there might be uh, as much as a half a million net loss to the workforce each year just because we're not replacing those that are retiring. But the other big factor is abortion. Uh, talk about that and just the real impact on the labor market. Well, the explosion in abortion is after Roe versus Wade. You did have some abortion before that because a few states had legalized it. But really, it really takes off. Um, and that was 50 years ago. So all the people aborted after Roe versus Wade would be of working age. They'd be 50 or younger. Um, so that's 66 million people. You take out the, those who would be 18 or younger, so too young to work. That puts you at about mid-40s. So about 44, you know, 44, 45 million people of working age 
were never allowed to be born. They don't exist. And I understand people can nitpick this. Well, yeah, but some of them would have died anyway. That's right. Some people die in the 40s, but some people would have had babies too. So it's hard to know exactly how many we've lost, but we know directly how many were lost to abortion. Well, those are people who aren't in the labor force right now. And when you look at sort of the prime years right now, it's sort of people like in the 30s and 40s. That's like, you know, that's important to the future of an economy. A very high abortion rates then. So we're missing about 20 million people uh, who would be in, in that zone. And those jobs aren't filled because there aren't people to fill them. But we still want things. We still want people to serve our food. We still want manufacturing. We still want to be driven places. If, you know, if we're in nursing homes, we still want somebody to change the bedpans. But we aborted them. And so they're not there to do it. So we're going to have a chronic problem with a shortage of labor because of a decision and now, obviously, people might be thinking, you know, that I'm, you know, minimizing this. This is a moral issue. It's the taking of a human life. Um, I'm not saying the economic loss is the main thing. The loss of people is the main thing. The image of God, people who, who you, know, you know, children, people who we would love, people who would love us. That's the main thing. But one of, of the many things that happens when you kill that many people is you don't have many workers and you're going to have an imbalance in your labor market. Yeah, and that's just a, a factor as we talk about this bigger uh, labor market discussion. Uh, Jerry, in terms of creating a robust workforce, uh, talk about just the whole fertility, the average number of children uh, Americans are having today versus in the past, and just immigration, how these two play in. Well, we're below replacement rate in general, and native-born Americans considerably below replacement rate. Um, so essentially what... Um, you know, the thing that keeps us from demographically imploding, frankly, is immigrants in two ways. One, immigrants come here and they live here, so there are more people. Two, immigrants have more children than native born Americans, so there's a higher fertility rate. So, uh, the, you know, immigration has to some degree rescued us. This would be a whole lot worse without immigration. And I know immigration is complicated and it's a political football and all the rest of it. I don't, you know, we don't need to get into all those details. I just I want to say, however we, we land, the Bible is clear on being kind to the immigrant, the sojourner. Well, it turns out that to whatever degree in the past we've been kind and welcoming to the immigrant and the sojourner, um, that has kept us from sliding into demographic winter. That's what's kept this from being much worse. Mm. Jerry, so where is this all headed as you just look at the aging of the workforce, the factors that you just mentioned? Uh, where do you think this plays out 10 and 20 years from now for the U.S.? Uh, we can't sustain our debt levels and our, our social safety net for the elderly without the people who are working and earning and paying taxes into the system. It's just unsustainable. Um, I'm not saying around the corner it's all going to blow up, but look, there was a European debt crisis in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, and it was a pension crisis for the most part, and there was a labor shortage. And I remember corresponding with Martin Wolf, who was the economics editor of the Financial Times, so very prestigious. And we were talking about the recovery um, and what was going on, and finally I said, look, what really happened here is a generation of Europeans chose abortion rather than childbirth, and now that's coming home to roost. And that was the last correspondence we had on the matter. He didn't want to discuss that, too sensitive. But Europe sure. committed demographic suicide. So then what did they do from there? There isn't a lot to do. Some yeah. sins are so heinous that they're not fixed just by repenting. It takes decades to fix them. And I think this is one of those. Now, it doesn't mean we can't do some things, right? We can have pro-growth tax policies. But here's the thing. Pro-growth tax policies, the incentives of, say, lower taxes, allowing you to keep what, you're, what you earn, incentives only work on people that exist. If, if somebody doesn't exist, it doesn't matter how great the incentive system is for people to work and the tax is low and the stable money. They're not here. Incentives don't affect them. They're with God. Um, so there's a limit that we can do there. I think maybe a resurgence of a biblical work ethic, and it is a biblical work ethic, that could help. You know, a lot of those guys need to get out of the basement and go to work. And I don't think that, you know, just I don't think incentives are enough. I think what they have to learn is six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord is a commandment to rest, but it's also a commandment to work. And I'm sorry, that probably goes from some early retirees, too. We need to get what we used to be called the biblical work ethic back, and that would go a long way towards making this less painful. 
Well, I love that, Jerry. And let's finish there. We've got about 30 seconds left. We were created before the fall of man to do productive and meaningful work. I love what you talk about when you say we're to take God's creation, creator God, and improve it. That's part of how he's wired us, and that really needs to be at the center, right? It does. And that's something where the church maybe needs to make a hard pivot towards having a positive theology of work. Positive theology of worship, absolutely, we've got that. Positive theology of family life, we've got that. It's not clear to me that pulpits are saying, work, you're supposed to work, you have to work, it glorifies God. Not Don't just work, work hard. Don't just work hard, but work well with excellence. Mm, I love it. Well, Jerry, let's leave it there. Thank you, my friend, for weighing in on this. A hard topic, and yet one that needs to be voiced and one that needs to be looked at through a biblical worldview. We're grateful for you stopping by and for you. MoneyWise contributor Jerry Boyer. He's the author of The Maker versus The Takers, what Jesus really said about social justice and economics. You can read his columns at Christian Post. We'll be right back. Stay with us. God's Word is packed with life-changing wisdom about your finances. And MoneyWise is here to help you and millions of others learn to be wise stewards. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on help from MoneyWise patrons, supporters of this mission, to help us continue and expand our outreach. Has God provided financial answers for you through this ministry? If so, please consider becoming a monthly MoneyWise patron. Visit MoneyWise.org and click Give on the homepage. If you're investing for retirement or any other goal, you may be wondering if it's possible to enjoy both profit and peace of mind no matter what's happening in the market. Sound Mind Investing has a short video webinar on that topic at soundmindinvesting.org. SMI has helped tens of thousands of Christians learn to be wise and faithful stewards in the area of investing. Profit and peace of mind no matter what's happening in the market at soundmindinvesting.org. Welcome back to Money Wise. I'm Rob West. This is the program where the 2300 verses on money and possessions found in God's Word intersect with today's financial decisions and choices. The number to get in on the conversation, 800-525-7000. To Maywood, Illinois, Ricardo, thanks for calling. Go ahead, sir. Hello there. I do listen to your program very frequently, and um, I uh, have talked to you in the past uh, I uh, am a strong believer. I believe in tithing. I, I don't know what to do with the money I'm making now. I went without a commission. I am an investment real estate broker, but I got very sick. I had a brain operation, and so many other things happened. I didn't make a commission since 2014. The last one was $400,000, and I bought property with it. Wow. And uh, But anyway, I have all this money coming now. And by the end of the year, I'll have about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars of taxable income, and I've got a two hundred and forty thousand dollar loss carry forward to lead up some of that. Yeah. But at any rate, I don't. I'm looking at annuities, and I just don't know which way to go with it. I want to buy a couple of houses that are a block away from me. They need to be rehabbed, and I would make about ninety thousand or hundred thousand dollars on each one of them. But my wife and I, we are married forty two years, and if we can't agree, we don't do it. And she don't want me to do it, and so <laughs> that's probably not an option. So uh, <laughs> annuity is probably the best way to go, and there are t- several types, but I don't know which would be the best. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, thanks for that background, Ricardo, and and thank you for sharing that principle that you and your wife have operated by, or if you're not in complete agreement, uh, you just don't do it in a situation like this that's involving uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, so I concur. Um, let me ask you, would you give me just a quick rundown uh, on the assets that you have prior to getting that 650000 uh that you have to pay some tax on? Um, what do you have currently in the way of uh, investable assets? I have right now liquid in the bank about sixty thousand. I have about forty thousand, forty-five thousand liquid. Okay. I put twenty thousand, ten and ten, ten for me, ten for Bonnie, into uh, the I bonds. Okay. And I own my my. I have a two flat. 
a two bedroom, two flat, and I just put a twelve thousand dollar walk in tub in our unit, and I <laughs> okay. have no debt on that building. I own another okay. two flat right next door to me. I have no debt on that one. So both buildings are probably worth a half a million dollars or more combined. Okay. And you're living in one of them, or are they in addition yes, to your I primary? Am. Yeah, okay. I, I'm but, living in one of them. That's my primary residence. Yeah, that's great. Now, I'm just wondering about income moving forward, though. I mean, obviously, you got this 309000 you got 650 coming. That's quite a bit of money. Uh, are You're 74 years old. Are you going to continue to do these deals, uh, or are you slowing down or thinking about retirement? See any, no, no, until I can't see anymore. Yeah. I already got right. one for 475000 uh, that's, that's not a bad gig. All right. So, uh, last question is you mentioned an annuity. Would you rather go an insurance product than have an advisor build a portfolio for you where you keep access to your funds, but put it to work on a conservative basis? Could be. I have two Christian brothers and sisters that go to my church. They're with a big, I won't say the name, but they're with a big national brokerage insurance yeah. company. They do annuities. They do all kinds of stuff. You're right. They are, they are helping me, but I, I know you are a very wise man. God has given you the gift, and <laughs> that's why I wanted to ask you. Yeah, but yes, well, I mean, I'm, I, I'm getting counsel, but... Sure. Uh, it, yeah. You know, the problem is I only had this money. Gosh, I went without. For, I was yeah. on food stamps. I went yeah. without for eight years. Wow. Uh, but that's okay. God for, God supplied every single need that me and Bonnie yeah. had. Wow. Wow, what a testimony to the Lord's faithfulness. And obviously, you've got quite a bit coming your way now. Yeah, I'd get some some wise counsel here. I think those two gentlemen you mentioned would be a great starting point. I'd perhaps put a third one in the mix. I'd connect with a certified kingdom advisor there in Illinois. Uh, just to look at, apart from somebody who might uh, sell you an insurance product, and, uh, you know, annuities aren't my first choice because you're locking up the money and they tend to be expensive and complicated. Uh, but they have a place if you want to transfer the risk can, uh, you know, have a guaranteed income through a fixed annuity or a floor on it through a variable annuity. That's certainly an option. But I'd look at another option where you have an advisor who's managing it for you a little more actively on a conservative basis that can uh, allow you to remain, you know, keep access to the funds, but have it still growing for you so that you can convert it to an income stream down the road if you need to. So I'd head to our website, moneywise.org, click find a CKA and get that third I, um, uh, advisor in the mix and then make your decision. We appreciate your call. Hey, Steve, thanks for your patience. Uh, go right ahead. How can I help you? All right. Yes. Um, so I've got a little girl. She's uh, two and a half years old, and I want to start. Uh, I want to put something together to start saving for for the future. And, you know, I've just looked at not really familiar what the best thing would to go with would be, but I wouldn't want to just say, okay, well, at 18, here you go. I'm not just going to give her a handful of money or anything like yeah. that. I just, you know, just something that, you know, just depending on her maturity as she grows, you know, what I yeah. feel like she can handle, you know. Sure. Just, well, the, no, I, I totally get that. And, and that has to do with what type of account you'd use. So uh, I would not recommend using a custodial account uh, like a UTMA or a UGMA because that would happen at the age of majority in your state. She'd get the money and she's making bad choices, uh, you know, God forbid, or she wants to buy a sports car, she'd be able to do that. So we want to keep it in your name. But if you wanted to earmark it for college, I'd use a 529 education savings plan. If you want it available for anything, then I would say open a taxable account in your name uh, or the name of you and your wife, and uh, let's just invest in a in what's called a, a robo account uh, using indexed ETFs. So essentially, you'd go to Betterment or the Schwab Intelligent portfolios. Uh, you could set up an automatic contribution. If you want to put in a lump sum, you can. But if you want to put in a little bit each month, you can set up an automatic account. Uh, the reason I like these for this purpose is, especially when you're starting out with a small amount, is there it's very low cost. So you might pay 20 basis points, one-fifth of 1%. Um, and you'll get a good, broad, diversification diversified portfolio. So based on the way you answer the questions in terms of your time horizon and risk tolerance, it'll build a portfolio probably of largely stocks, 
and, and bonds, but it would use ETFs that are indexes. So you would own the S&P 500, the 500 largest companies in the country, or the Russell 1000. So you, you're not picking individual winners and losers. You're just essentially capturing the broad moves of the market. And you know, over the next decade, you should do well with that. And you'd still control the money, which would allow you to be in the driver's seat as to when she gets it. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Hey, we appreciate you calling today. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. You too. Well, we're out of time once again, but we'll come back and do it all again next time. I appreciate your carving some time out of your busy day to join us here on the program. Remember, if you missed any part of today's program or perhaps missed a past program or want to hear it again, you can do that at moneywise.org or on the free MoneyWise app in your app store. And if you enjoyed the program, I hope you'll tell a friend about it and then plan on joining us again next time right here on MoneyWise. MoneyWise is provided by MoneyWise Media and listeners like you.